Well, Bordabab, good morning, everyone. We are just waiting to see the thumbs up from the back. The thumb is up, ladies and gentlemen. The thumb is up. So uh, we're able to welcome those online and those who are here in the building this morning to our service of worship. Ah, it is good to be together. Let's, uh, let's take a moment, as we always do, to ground ourselves in God, to take a breath, to be reflecting on here we are, here and now, and that God is with us. Let's be still. Please join in with the words in bold. Online, on paper, and on church premises, we gather as a community of faith in God's subversive world. We gather to celebrate that no darkness can extinguish light, to remember that love will always be more powerful than death, and to trust that peace will always be stronger than violence. We gather people of faith in the light of God's love. And so in the light of God's love, we come to our first hymn of praise today. A hymn that reminds us that there is a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. Please stand as you are able for our first hymn of praise. see that there are a, a, few, uh, a few rough bits in the service today, partly because uh, of our musical roads are not kicking in yet, and partly because bits that we are still gathering from the service last week. And also over here you have uh, an unput back baptistry, so we don't want you tripping over and suing us for thousands. But um, that is a good thing because it was uh, opened when we had the Coidelan pupils here. 
this morning to learn about the church, but more uh, this week, but uh, more on that later. When it comes to our notices this week, uh, I think we're very aware that it's not been an easy week uh, for us as a church. Um, on Friday, we had the funeral of Val um, and began to, to say our goodbyes to her. And of course, this week, we heard the incredibly sad news about Keris. On top of this, at Castle Square uh, last Sunday, you, you will know possibly that they made the decision to start the closing process. Um, now, as concerns that decision, our God is a God of beginnings and endings. We're told that there is a time to be born and a time to die, a time for every season under the sun. And we know that death is a part of the gospel, and that Jesus took on that death, that Jesus died on the cross, but that that's not the end of the story. And so we remember that for Keris. We remember that with Val. We remember that with all our lost loved ones, that they're not lost to God. And it put me in mind the words of Paul in his first letter to the church in Thessalonica, mourn, but not without hope. We mourn the loss of Val and Keris, but we don't do so without hope. For we believe in the God who weeps with us, whose life of love took him to the cross, but also to the empty tomb, and who goes to his father's house, where there are many rooms prepared for each one of us, for Val, for Keris, for all of us here today. So we mourn, but not without hope. And talking of um, our and Christ's father's house, this evening, for our, our storytelling communion on Zoom, the theme is going to be home. So stories about home, poems, anecdotes, um, from the silly to the serious. If you want to gather online and, and share your stories about what home means to you. It could be God's home, our shared home, the earth, or your, uh, your very literal home. Tomorrow evening, here, we also have uh, an interfaith evening. Um, uh, uh, Mark Stone from the Reform Synagogue uh, in Cardiff um, and uh, Asim Hafiz, I think it is, from uh, the Dar al Isra Mosque in Cardiff are joining us to have an evening of, of learning together um, where we're going to think about what is the significance of Jerusalem for Jews, Christians and Muslims. So if you are able to gather, um, that's at half seven here. It will be live streamed and later available on YouTube if you're not able to make it for whatever reason. Um, of course, in the newsletter, there's news of other, of other things to take into account, other people who might need our prayers, other celebrations to be had to. Because we remember, though it has been a, a difficult week for many of us and for many other reasons besides, there will be blessings along the way, glimpses of grace and goodness that would have come across our path. And so with that in mind, let's take a couple of minutes then to think back over the past week to think of the times we felt most alive or most connected to others or closest to God and to give thanks. Perhaps to think of the times where we felt disconnected or on our own and to seek out where was God's presence there. Times we might want to say sorry or help. Whatever it might be, let's be still for a minute or two and pray with God.
God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of all grace, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains life, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, for the love of family and friends without which life would feel hollow. We thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, the joy that the ear can hear, for the unknown that we cannot behold, filling the universe with wonder, for the expanse of space that draws us beyond the definitions of ourselves. We thank you for setting us in communities, for the families who nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for strangers who welcome us into their midst. We thank you for this day, for one more day to love and be loved, one more day to work for justice and peace, for your grace to be felt and embraced for your promise of being with us in this day. And along with the many blessings of the week, we know that there have been bumps along the road, times when we felt abandoned or overwhelmed or anxious, times when we've neglected to care for creation or for one another, or for ourselves. Times when we've forgotten your love or ignored your voice. So if some here need to say, help me, and if some need to say, hold me, and if some need to say, forgive me, then let these be said now in confidence by us. O Christ, in whose heart is both welcome and warning, say to us, do in us, reveal for us the things that will make us whole. And we will wait, and we will praise you. Amen. Well, with, uh, with so much suspicion at the moment, um, some of it justified about the church, being invited to talk to people outside the church about who we are and what we believe is increasingly rare. But it's something that happened twice this week. As I said, on the Thursday afternoon, Coydalan pupils were welcomed into this building and shown all around, shown uh, the symbols we use and uh, the practices that we have. Whilst on Tuesday, I led a workshop with the, I've got to remember the title, Independent Office for Police Conduct on Equality, Diversity and the Christian Faith. So it was great to be able to share something of who we are with them. And I did. Through uh, images, I, I told them, and I love this, Renda. You just see how small Magdy and Susan were then. I told them how we were an ecumenical church uh, and a church of, uh, of unity and diversity. I told them how we were a church who like eating, um, whether that's a Welsh thing or a Christian thing or a bit of both. A church who looks beyond our borders, uh, and that was a picture of our carols and cocktails evening at Club of Bond a couple of years back. And a church that campaigns, and that led me into talking to them about some, where we stand on some of the LGBTQ plus issues. And as I gave the talk, and I explained the differences of opinion in the, across the church about these, I gave them a bit of a quiz about the Bible. Um, and uh, just a quick few questions. And, uh, and one of them asked me, oh, well, how do you think your congregation would get on with this? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so as it is exam season, uh, we're going to see how you get on. Now, I'm very aware as I say this that I, I see two biblical scholars in sight. So don't, don't look at their answers. Don't just copy them. But I'm going to ask you in a good Bethlehem wedding style, 
uh, to raise your hands like this when you, when you think it's the right answer. So I'll go through each question. There's only, well, six of them-ish. Uh, raise your hands like this when, you, say, when I, you think I say the right answer. I won't be marking. Okay. Question one. Some of these are a little oversimplified. Uh, question one. What does the word Bible mean? Uh, so I'll go through them, and then I'll to ask you to put up your letter. So does it mean witness? Does it come from the word meaning books? Does it come from the word meaning truth? Or is it something to do with weapon? Let's see your answers. A. Anyone for A? Witness. We've got one witness, a couple of witnesses. B. Books. Oh, a flurry of hands for books. C. Truth. D. Weapon. Uh, no, well, sadly, we know it's often used at that. The correct answer is indeed books, coming from, from Biblia. Uh, and, and for the French amongst us, Bibliotheque, of course, okay, the this, this same derivation. <coughs> Biblos. Oh, no, it, it, it does come from the Greek, absolutely, but it's the same, same word that, that, that ends up in French as, as Bibliotheque. Biblos, it does mean books. That is correct. That's hopefully what I was trying to teach them on Tuesday, whether they got that or not. We'll see, we'll see. Let's see. So John's saying the Bible means books. How many books are there then in the Bible? Ah, <laughs> see, this is why I'd give it to... So, good... So are there 24, 66, 73, or 81? You might think any of those answers might be right. Let's have a look. Let's see what we think. Who thinks there are 24 books in the Bible? Anyone for 66? A few hands, a few jazz hands. Uh, don't, don't, don't grab your Bible. No, you're not allowed, Claire. Anyone for 73? <coughs> oh, there's a few for 73 too. Anyone for 81? Oh, there's even one or two for 81. Ooh. Yeah, as Vivian says, some people are hedging their bets. Well, it absolutely depends on who you're asking. Uh, the Hebrew Bible, what, what, what sometimes we call the Old Testament, for, for most Jews, they would say there were actually 24. The way that we divide up the books, you know, um, one kings, two kings, traditionally isn't done. The Protestant Bible usually has the 66. The, the Catholic Bible, 73, with the Apocrypha, those extra books. And the Ethiopic, other, other denominations have a couple of extra, such as the Ethiopic Orthodox Church that has 81. Okay, so far, so good. Let's see if that continues. How many different Christian denominations read the Bible? So, how many different Christian denominations read the Bible? Put your hand up if you think it's around, 80, uh, around 45. Around 450. Oh, we've got one, one or two. Around 4,500. <laughs> or I think most for that. Who thinks for, around 45,000? Wow. I'm afraid you are correct. There are around 45,000 different Christian denominations. And Christ prayed that we may be one. Hmm. We may want to reflect on that. Okay. Oh, here, and here is uh, just a, a few of the... Uh, the wonderful ones that we have. Uh, there's Baptist, Congregational, Presbyterian, and URC. We are covered here. Some of the, some of the big ones. Um, okay. This is the question I gave them. Who wrote the Bible then? Was it God, Moses, Jesus, or none of the above? Anyone for God? Anyone for Moses? Jesus? None of the above? Um... John wants an e, ever the nonconformist. Love it, John. It was a large committee. Well, perhaps they were the editing team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, generally, we think there was well over 40 different individual writers and then many, many editing teams and many different sources that came together. So, and they were, sadly, we think, m mostly, if not all, men. And as we know... Um, those who write uh, our history determine what it looks like. They determine who's the victor, etc. So we, we remember that as... Oh, I didn't have the quote there. But the quote that I like is, um, 
until the lion tells his side of the story, the hunter will always be the hero. Anyway, five then, in which language was the Bible written? Was it English? Anyone for English? Come on, it's, isn't that the language of God? <laughs> Is it Aramaic? Yeah, but a few hands. Any Greek? Yeah, Hebrew? Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? I'm going to put them on the spot, especially seeing as John is piping up. John, Ray, any, any thoughts for this question? How would you answer this? So a couple of strands of Aramaic. Any, any, any books in the, in the uh, Hebrew Testament that have a lot of Aramaic? Ah, oh, that, that's it, that's it. Absolutely. As, as they were saying, mostly, yeah, mostly Hebrew uh, for the Jewish Testament or Hebrew Testament, mostly Greek for the New Testament. As John says, there are a few lines in Aramaic in the New, and as Ray said, uh, lots of Daniel, the book of Daniel, and of Ezra are in Aramaic too. Um, and that's, that was one of the questions that, yeah, that divided people. Okay, last major question then. Oh, uh, these, were, these were the examples I gave, the problems of translation. Um, I think, and, and John and Ray might be able to tell me, that the Hebrew, is it keren, which can mean shines with God's glory. Um, Hebrew is always difficult because it doesn't really do um, vowels much. Um, but apparently, the word can be translated as shone, like shone with glory, like when Moses came down the mountain, or it can mean horns. So you'll see some images of Moses coming down the mountain, shining, you know, with countenance, and some, he's got actual horns, a little bit like that. Anyway, um, and of course, you may have seen in the news a couple of weeks back, the Sinners or the Wicked Bible. Uh, they found a new one of these in Australia. If you look closely under uh, verse 14, Thou shalt commit adultery. Mm, that's not coming from me. Um, okay, last question then. Which of these is not a real Bible? Which of these is not a real Bible? Is it the manga Bible? That's a, a form of um, Japanese animation or cartoon. Is it the brick Bible? The Klingon Bible or the English Bible? Put your hands up if you think it's the manga Bible. <coughs> Got one for that. The brick Bible? Mm, got a few hands up for that. The Klingon Bible. A few, couple of hands for that. The English Bible. And one or two hands for that. Technically, it is the English Bible. Because there are over a hundred different translations of uh, the Bibles in English. Uh, a few, a fair few, I looked at, I, I think I got to about 20 in Welsh, but there's uh, over 100 in English, whereas the Manga Bible is, uh, is a real thing, the Klingon Bible is, and the Brick Bible I have in my office. Uh, I'm happy to show people that over coffee. It's amazing. So, the last question I had with them was, uh, led us into the topic, what does the Bible say about the LGBTQ plus community? That is a whole other question for a whole other week. Possibly we'll come on to some of this, in a fortnight when Ray will be leading our Pride-themed uh, service. <clears throat> but so what, you might think? What's, what's, uh, what was all the point of this? Well, I was trying to explain to, to the group that that's, our understanding of the Bible often dictates um, where Christians land on certain issues. I was listening this morning uh, on Radio 4, they were talking about uh, in America uh, at the issue of, of abortion at the moment and how one Catholic bishop has said he won't give communion to certain people, won't share mass because of their stance on communion. What, what we believe about communion and what we believe about abortion and a lot of other issues often comes down to our understanding of the Bible. But as we've said rightly, as the hecklers and the, the hands showed, there is no such thing as the Bible. There are many Bibles and many, many different books in the Bibles and many, uh, well, they were written in different languages and many translations and many different interpretations. But today we're going to think a little bit more then of how do we learn, how do we learn about God or how do we learn from God? Because from all Christians, we, we cite the, the Bible as a, a source, as a part of our learning, a significant one. For some Christians... 
The Bible is more like a textbook that has all the answers written down and you need to cram them to pass the test. For other Christians, it's, uh, it's like a library, as John says, of different books, which tells us something about God, but also is, tells us something about the context of the time it was written, the priorities and the prejudices that were commonplace then. And others still would say that the, we can learn about God or from God through the Bible, but that's only part of our curriculum, that we can learn about God in creation or through the movement of the Spirit or even in uh, those made in God's image and what they create, the stories, the art, even films, who would imagine? But these, uh, these differences in how we view the Bible, they can cause great division. They can also provoke great reflection on what do we believe as individuals? What do we believe about God and where do we get that from? I'd just like us to pause before we come to our next hymn. Where do you learn about God? Who in your life, whether growing up, whether in church, whether beyond the church, how have you learned what you know or what you believe about God? Let's stay there with that just for a few seconds as you might think back to people or times or lessons that you've learned about God. Let me continue to reflect on that as we come to our second hymn today. Help us, O Lord, to learn. This is our prayer. Will you please stand as you are able. So here's another question for you this morning. I apologize if you didn't come here to think today. But when was the last time you changed your mind about something? <laughs> I hear from one source there, she changes it every day. <laughs> Which is no bad thing, because many of us, I think, can be very bad at being willing to change our mind. Because to change your mind uh, means admitting, oh, maybe you, you hadn't quite seen the whole picture before. But I wonder with the rest of us, when was the last time we changed our minds? It could be something trivial, or it could be something pretty major. When through a learning experience or a sudden revelation did we change our minds? Well, today's reading is one which contains, I think, a, an intriguing story about Jesus. One in which he seems to change his mind. That's one interpretation of it anyway. So we're going to hear it now as Leslie comes to read from, to us 
uh, a few words from the Gospel according to Matthew. And I wonder what we will learn from listening to it. <coughs> Reading is taken from chapter 15 of the... Actually, sorry. We have a slight... Yes. Linda and I miscommunicate. Do you want to go over and use the letter? Oh, right, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> this is called a technical fault. <laughs> The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 15, reading through from verses 21 to 28, a woman's faith. Jesus left that place and went off to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region came to him. Son of David, she cried out, have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon and is in a terrible condition. But Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples came to him and begged him, send her away, she's following us and making all this noise. Then Jesus replied, I have been sent only to those lost sheep, the people of Israel. At this, the woman came and fell at his feet. Help me, sir, she said. Jesus answered, it isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's true, sir, she answered, but even the dogs eat the leftovers that fall from their master's table. So Jesus answered her, you are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed. Thanks be to God. So I wonder what we learn from that difficult passage. What on earth was going on there? Well, just before this, Jesus had had another run-in with the Pharisees before getting annoyed with the disciples over their lack of understanding when it came to parables. So far, everyone is getting an F- minus from Jesus, the Nazarene teacher. And then, like a teacher getting interrupted on their way to the staff room and wanting just five minutes of peace, Jesus has withdrawn from the crowds. Mark's version even says he didn't want anyone to know he was there. When along comes a pupil asking for some additional help. Jesus doesn't answer her at first. And the other disciples, the other pupils, tell her to go away or, or want to. But she persists and begs for some help. To which Jesus tells her that he's not even her teacher. He's got his own class to deal with. In fact, he puts it a little more starkly than that. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Ouch. This is Jesus at his grumpiest and perhaps most human. Biblical commentators have all sorts of theory about what's going on here, particularly as dogs was a uh, often a term used to, uh, a derogatory term to, to use to uh, refer to Gentiles, to non-Jews. So some say he's being playful, inviting her to have a conversation. Others say he just called her a bitch. He's including her in the dialogue, others suggest. This is inclusive. No, he's telling Gentiles that they're not his concern, others say. It's a tough passage. But whichever the case, and it is a big whichever, to be fair, the women, woman's response is an absolute belter. Yes, it is, Lord, she says, effectively telling Jesus he's got it wrong. For even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. There's some absolutely glorious wordplay here, but we've not got time for that. So we'll focus on the fact that when Jesus says he's not there to tend to the Gentiles, not there to feed the dogs... The woman tells him that he is. For even the Gentiles need to be taught and healed and blessed by him. Even the dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. I mean, this woman seems to, to teach Jesus, to absolutely school him. This is the pupil telling the exhausted teacher that actually, yes, he is her teacher. And yes, she needs some extracurricular help. The bravery of that. The downright cheek of it. 
To which Jesus replies, you know, you're right. A plus. You have great inside and faith. Absolutely. Your daughter will be healed. And she was. And it's the only time in any of the Gospels that Jesus truly commends someone for what they say. Which in itself is, is radical. The only time he says your words I mean, are amazing here. Your words have healed your daughter is to a, a woman and a religiously and ethnically different woman. Everything for me about this encounter is fascinating and we could have a whole sermon series on it but I'll spare you that. Instead, what, what might we learn from it? Well, when I was a teacher about 10 major changes in curriculum ago, we were told that in RE, pupils should have a learning from and a learning about objective each lesson. So one way in which we could learn from whatever religion or worldview we were studying, and one way we could learn about them. So let's start with the learning from. What can we learn from this encounter? I think a lot. And I think a lot of what we can learn is from the woman. We can learn from her courage. In a patriarchal world where she was an other in terms of gender, ethnicity, and religion, she would not let a tired teacher or his disparaging friends silence her request. We can learn from her passion for justice, for she made a scene, she blocked the path of men, she risked her reputation and personal safety by reproaching a man in public, all to stop the suffering of another, her daughter. And we can learn from her inclusive worldview. For after the Pharisees and disciples have been scolded by Jesus, after Jesus himself suggested he did not have time to deal with those outside his remit, she reminded him that his care was to extend beyond the normal parameters, that even Gentile foreign women were to be blessed through him. I think this was an incredible woman and a pioneer a foremother to the suffragettes and to Malala and to Greta Thunberg and that we would do well to learn a lot from her. And what can we learn about here then? Well, with any biblical passage, we might ask the question, what does this teach us about God? What does this say about who God is? And it's a rich passage for that. If Jesus is not his usual affable self here, Although we might, some might suggest that that's overly uh, portrayed. Having done battle with the Pharisees and been let down by the disciples, he is exhausted and exasperated. And just when he wants to disappear from public view, here's this woman wailing and begging for more from him. Initially, he says nothing. He walks on. And then he says something about sheep and his task, his mission to Israel only for her to come back at him again with a repost which displayed faith and insight and inclusion. And he, according to some commentators at least, he changes his mind, or seems to. He does, as the papers would say today, a U-turn. He actually commends this difficult woman, praises her faith, and heals her daughter. So what does this tell us about God? I think... For me, it tells me something that about how in the person of Jesus, God did change God's mind. And if this sounds a little heretical, there is precedent for it. Think Abraham bargaining with God over Sodom, or how seafood was definitely off God's dietary requirements before Peter and that dream came along. And besides which, we don't really think that Jesus came out of the womb knowing everything, do we? He had to learn to speak. He had to learn about the faith through the scriptures of old. He had to learn about people through experience and relationship, through love and loss. But simply, God in Jesus learned. Surely this is part of the mystery and the wonder of the incarnation, that the omniscient God dribbled in a manger, that the eternal Christ took on an earthly body and brain, that in order to show us how much we are loved, God Almighty became God all vulnerable. For me, this doesn't diminish God at all, but makes God even more incredible, wonderful, amazing, whilst also being a great lesson for us that we don't have to pretend to know everything. In fact, Jesus gave the greatest condemnation to those who did. Rather, let's follow the example of the Nazarene rabbi 
who was vulnerable enough to listen to another, who was humble enough to learn more from that, her, and who was secure enough to change his mind. In the Bible and through other people and with the movement of the Spirit, there's so much more to learn of God's goodness and grace and love. So let's not limit our learning or put limits on God's inclusion. Or certainly not try to anyway. For the love of God really is broader than the measure of our mind. And the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. I think that's a lesson we can all take to heart. Amen. Take a moment just to sit with that. And then Vivian will come up and lead our prayers for ourselves, for others, for the all creation. Let us pray. Creator God, you love all that you have made, the world and all its creatures. Your love gathers and unfolds all things. Your heart breaks when any part of your creation suffers. So God, as our awareness grows of you present all around, May we be so attuned that we weep where you weep and our hearts break while yours is broken. We offer back this complex, crazy world like children offering our broken Lego sets to parents, asking that you fix it. Parent God, in love you won't do as we ask, that you will kneel beside us and patiently show us how to make things better. You will unearth the wisdom that you created in us for the healing of the world. You will affirm us and give us each a unique part to play in changing the world, in changing those who limit your love in being vulnerable enough to listen to the marginalized and to learn from them, in ushering in your justice and your peace. So God, prepare to roll up our sleeved, sleeves and work alongside you. We pray for world leaders that they too may be filled with your wisdom and love and your healing power. We pray that their eyes and our eyes may be open to the need to find new ways forward and the possibilities that abound for honoring all creation and for building nations where all are valued, where all matter, where the economy is modeled on your divine economy. We pray for all who live in fear today and for those whose fears have been realized, those who mourn loved ones, those who see no light of dawn after darkness. We pray too for those who have given up hoping for different or better. May we hold out hope and faith enough for the world and may we live in love. We pray for those we know who are in need today, particularly thinking of Stephen and all who are mourning Caris. As we give thanks for the way her life resounded with your harmonies of love, we pray for comfort, peace, and strength. 
and because words often fail us, we come to you in a time of stillness, naming the people and places that are on our hearts and minds today. We thank you, God, that you hear our prayers and tend to our needs. Open our hearts to your spirit, moving around us, between us, and within us, until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in the healing of all that is broken in love, in hope, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we continue our worship by taking up our offertory. We're going to remain seated as a, a hymn will be played. You can join in or you can listen along. We take our offertory in response to our prayers. moment, this time, this space, and with that we give you our gifts, our time, and our entire lives. Take them, we pray. Use them for the furtherance of your kingdom of justice and joy. May they enable people to see something of your love, your grace, your wonder in this town and throughout all creation. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So take this moment, time and space, we sang. Take these friends around. Make us a fellowship of grace where your love is found. As we come to communion, we remember that that doesn't mean that we're always going to be best friends. It doesn't mean we're always going to think the same way about everything, about the Bible, or about the Jubilee about who we are as church but what it does mean is around this table we remember that whatever our gifts and graces and whatever our faults and foibles here we are welcomed and embraced as children of God and just as that is true for each of us it's true for everyone else too sometimes that's a factor a, a belief a truth of joy Sometimes it's one that causes a bit of patience and understanding and a few prayers for grace. But around this table, around this meal, we become one family again. And so before we come to communion, 
we have the chance of sharing Christ's peace with each other. And we're going to do that again today through the British Sign Language, still while you know, we know COVID is still around. And so, just to remind you, we're going to share the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share that with those to our left and our right. And those online, feel free to text someone and share peace with them that way. And so with the, the peace still being shown and shared, we uh, prepare for this meal. And it's set differently than normal, but set with clean linen, with silver, with bread and outpoured wine. And we gather around it, perhaps unprepared, our hands unwashed or our heads distracted. But we gather around as members of one family, as children of God, as siblings of Christ. And that we might pause to remember, why do we gather around a table? Why do we take funny morsels of bread and teeny sips of wine? Why do we call this a feast when everything about it is a token? Here is why. Late one spring evening, at a time when everyone was celebrating God's goodness a long time ago, Jesus and his friends, his pupils, had one last meal together. They borrowed a room and enjoyed a hearty dinner as they sang old psalms and prayed their prayers. And Jesus continued to teach them in what he said and what he did. And so after the meal, he did something odd. He took the bread that was left over and he said a prayer, then he broke it. And shared it with his friends saying, when you eat bread, think about me. Because just as this bread is broken, so my body will be too. And Jesus' friends didn't really understand what he meant. But no one dared ask him. So they took the bread and ate it. And so will we. And after they had had their tea and were feeling pleasantly full, Jesus did something else odd. He picked up a goblet of wine on the table. Thank God for it and shared it around his friends and said, when you drink wine, think about me. Because just as this wine has been poured out, so my blood will be poured out and there will be a new bond between people and God. And Jesus' friends weren't entirely sure what he meant. But they didn't dare ask, so they did what he said. They took the cup of wine and they drank it. And so will we. And ever since that night, People of different ages and ethnicities, different sexualities and genders, people with different learning styles and philosophies have gathered together as one, as one family around one table to eat bread and drink wine, to remember Jesus and give thanks for his life of compassion, for his death and resurrection, and for his being with us here and now. With that in mind, let's do as Jesus did that night. Let's pray to God, our parent. Let's pray. You meet us here, God. This is what has been passed on to us, what has been taught to us. This is what we believe. That you met us in the beginning, a word over the nothing that holds everything in hope, which brought light and life and in time brought us, you and us, relationship, conversation, covenant, partnership with you in all you made, love and responsibility, a sacred way in which we could live freely. And we desacralized it, we know that. You and us became us and you when it suited us. We preferred the power for ourselves, and so we've wrecked and plundered much that you have given us ever since. And yet you still meet us here. Even in our denial and betrayal, you love without limit. Teachers and prophets you sent, wisdom and mercy you spoke. 
Even if we rejected what they shared, you kept sending all the way to your first great plan, the new creation in your son who meets us in our here. Living with us, loving us, teaching us, saying, come all you who are worn down, your rest is in me. Saying, I have come that you might be free. Saying, take, eat, me broken that you might live. Take, drink, me given that you might be alive. Saying, all is completed. And it was on the third day that the word over the nothing that holds everything in hope brought about the promise that was always there. And the spirit, your vibrant spirit, meets us here. In the first light of dawn and the dark of the night, you meet us. In the arms that hold us in love and the dark places of our loneliness, you meet us. In the company of your church, what has been, what is now and what will be, you meet us. In today and whatever tomorrow holds, you meet us. So at this table right now, you speak a word, and you hold everything in hope. Bless you. Send your spirit again amongst us, we ask, so that these elements might be for us your life-giving presence. Grant your mercy and peace, we request. We ask, but you have already granted. Thus, as a people met by you, as your people call to walk in your way, we pray, pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying in a multitude of languages and versions, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Christ and it's broken for us all. We do this in remembrance of him.
cup of blessing, we drink and give thanks. And we continue in prayer. Loving God, you have met us here and we are grateful. You walk with us as we go from here and we are blessed. You call us into your abundant life and we are so privileged. We thank and praise you again this day in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we come to our final hymn of praise today, a hymn that uh, reminds us that as we go, Christ goes with us. Forth in the peace of Christ we go. Would you please stand as you are able? service it's a good time to remember that the coffee table can often be as sacred as the communion table and we will have coffee served after the service and so our service here is complete but our service out there begins afresh so may the love which overcomes all differences which heals all wounds which invites us to learn of God's goodness afresh be in us among us now and always and the blessing of God, creator, son, and spirit, be upon us this day and forevermore. Amen.
Oh, do you want me? 